Woohoo! Let's do this. Let's talk. Hey, good afternoon, good evening, wherever the hell you are. It might be good morning if you're in uh, Europe. It's already morning. <sighs> it's been a long damn day of video calls, and now I'm basically on another one. That's the great thing about streaming. It was hella preparation for being on Zoom all the time for work. Let's talk perfectionism. Um, this is really funny, right? So my wife said to me, how are you going to coach on perfectionism when you have that problem and uh, you don't know how to solve it for yourself? Um, and that's a totally fair question. Uh, and so how am I going to do that? Well, I do have answers to that. And um, actually, I want to show a picture uh, to set up this topic. And I want to acknowledge uh, awesome. So let's see how this shows up. We'll go back here. So this is my website, um, which I hadn't updated in a long time. So I was kind of remiss. And this photo I used is one I've used before. But the photo is the top of a poster board I made in a coaching seminar I went to two years ago. And you can see my problem was perfectionism even then because I was trying to figure out how to be less than perfect. Um, I was trying to figure out how to not have this problem, how to silence the critics in my head, how to silence my desire to always have more achievement, which is what the X is drawn through. And like this guy holding the sign and looking like uh, a professor saying more. Um, so perfectionism, there's a couple of things I want to talk about tonight. Uh, number one, I want to be transparent. I have this problem. Awesome, who's in chat and helped me put this together, he has this problem too. And he's 20 and I'm 50. So it can be a problem all your life and it can come and go. So I'm going to hop up here in my chair. Ah suck on into the microphone and let's talk about it. And I want you to ask me questions about this as well as make suggestions. So why did I want to talk about perfectionism? Well, partly it's physician heal thyself. Um, I need to get better at this and uh, talking through how to do it is part of how to get better. Second, I realize perfection really comes from emotional roots. And so let me flip over real quick and just show you the basic Wikipedia article on this. Because why does perfectionism matter? You either are a perfectionist at some level or you're going to work with them or you're going to work for them. And depending on which of those you do, you need to know. Uh, you need to know about perfectionism, know where it comes from, and know what you're going to do about it. You also need to know that there's a school of thought that believes there's a good perfectionism and there's a bad perfectionism. So good perfectionism is like high standards where you feel motivated to achieve your best. So like PMA Dota, maybe he's a perfectionist Dota player after 18,000 hours. And maybe he only drives himself to be the best but he doesn't get down on himself and be critical and negative of himself when he falls short in a match. Um, <clears throat> then there's a the sort of person who beats themselves up. So let's take a quick look at perfectionism. And I'm just, I'm literally just on the, um, I'm just on Wikipedia here real quick, but there's a couple things in here in understanding uh, this that I think are just worth quoting and there's lots of sources for this, but Wikipedia is a fine one They define it as perfectionist strain compulsively and unceasingly toward unattainable goals and Important measure their self-worth by productivity and accomplishment so this has been me my whole life and um may or may not, I'm sure it has a lot to do with why I've achieved success, but it also has to do with a lot of unhappiness in my life. So I want to talk about that balance and be transparent with y'all and try and help you get the benefits without all the pain. Second, pressuring oneself to achieve unrealistic goals inevitably sets up a person for disappointment. Important, 
Perfectionists tend to be harsh critics of themselves when they fail to meet their standards. True. They also tend to be uh, harsh critics of others. Maybe not as harsh, but they can have very high standards for others much of the time, not always. So then this next section here talks about normal versus neurotic. Um, and they give some definition of that further down. Um, and this is really interesting. There's a bunch of different definitions here. I thought this one was pretty interesting. It's six vectors of perfectionism. Concern over making mistakes. Awesome shared with me. He worries about that. High personal standards. Okay, that sounds good. Ah, now we get to the psychological underpinnings. The perception of high parental expectations. So which of y'all in chat either have or had helicopter parents? The super demanding, expect perfection, tiger parents who once you get A's and everything, go to the best schools, etc., etc., etc. Dome Kang. <laughs> Duke of Thought, no, but Smiley. Roxio, yeah. Oh, Lead Vitamin, I'm sorry. It sounds like you actually wish they cared. The son of a professor at IITD. Where is TD? Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. Is that IITD, Sharma? Uh, Derek Bunch, not you. Um, Valerian, it is you. Yeah, okay. So any of the IITs. For those of you who don't know the Indian schooling system, the top half dozen schools in India are the Indian Institutes of Technology. Uh, oh my Jesus, fighting pickles. I'm guessing that you had this problem then. High parental expectations. Yeah, IIT is the Stanford of India. It certainly is the University of California system. The top schools in India are the IITs. Um, <clears throat> and they have huge entrance tests to get into them. Okay, so, and then related to high expectations, the perception, it says the perception of high parental criticism. And certainly my parents were super critical. The doubting of the quality of one's actions and a preference for order and organization. That's what this guy claims. So I want to see um, if I can find the other section in here I want to quote because um, it was really interesting to me. And then we'll go back to talking. Where was this? Psychological implications. So it causes depressed, depression, anxiety, all these problems. Um, this is... This is uh, I used to believe, by the way, I grew up early in my career, I thought having emotions was sort of a distraction from being perfectly effective. So that wasn't a really good plan. I've had to change that thought a little bit. Um, here's another good one, right? Those who display maladaptive perfectionist tendencies, such as rumination over past events or fixation on mistakes, tend to utilize blah, blah, blah. They do a bunch of bad stuff. Now, this talks about the positive aspects, right? Uh, in the positive form, perfectionism can provide the driving energy which leads to great achievement. So this is why somewhere in here and somewhere in some of the stuff um, Awesome sent me, it's acknowledged that perfectionism is a double-edged sword. It can both make you unhappy and make you great. So my point here in trying to coach tonight let me see if I can find that. We don't need PMA's resume anymore. Um, let's see. Yeah. So I don't... Um, awesome found this quote for us. Like any extreme trait, perfectionism can be a double-edged sword. Having high standards and being hardworking can help you stand out in a crowded field. Very true. Uh, and their tenacity can help them improve their skills over time. Also true. And to an extent, being very conscious can help avoid errors. However, what are the dark sides? Never finishing anything because it's not quite good enough. Never accepting anything because even though you've finished it, you're not happy with it. So never delivering. Um, uh, and then just being unhappy. Uh, being unhappy about your results even when they're good. All right. So I framed this problem. I've talked to a bunch of you. Uh, about why this matters. How many of you work with perfectionists or have a perfectionist boss? 
go ahead. Just like you told me in chat, how many of you have demanding parents? Professors count, right? People who are never happy. Their sentence is always, well, that's pretty good, but, and then a whole list of things. So Hephaestus says yes. He works for himself. So he's saying he does that to himself. I think Pentaquan has this problem from what he's indicating. Um, you have a pragmatic boss. That's good, Renee. That's excellent. Who else either does or doesn't have a perfectionist at the helm? Because I would say, by and large, Amazon does. And I want to be clear, I'm going to talk about the culture, not any one person. And my views, I'm not speaking for Amazon. Uh, <clears throat> but where I work and where I've worked the last 15 years, we talk about, um, we have a leadership principle. I can go find it real quick. Let's do this. Um, Amazon leadership principles. Called relentlessly high standards, um, which is going to sound an awful lot like perfectionism. So let's see here. Where is it? Yeah, yeah. Insist on the highest standards. We'll pop this up real quick. So this is one of Amazon's leadership principles. Insist on the highest standards. Leaders have relentlessly high standards. Many people think these standards are unreasonably high. Oh, but wait. Leaders are continually raising the bar and drive their teams to deliver high quality products. Leaders ensure blah, blah, blah about defects, the rest of it. This sounds a lot like perfectionist language to me. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to catch up on chat real quick. Perfectionists seem more likely to burn out. Yes, Hephaestus, that's true. Um, let's see, anything else here? My old boss was a perfectionist and the banality of evil. <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay, Liger, that sounds harsh. Okay, look, so what's my point here? Amazon is not the only company like this. We are a company who writes it down. What do you do in this environment, right? I mean, if you, if you read these words in the worst possible way, like if I went through and highlighted them, right, relentlessly, unreasonably, um, continually raising, drive their teams, those are pretty militant words. And uh, look, Amazon's one of the most successful companies out there. So going back to this slide, um, you know, uh, having high standards of being hardworking can help someone stand out in a crowded field. Well, that's, that's what Amazon has done, right? There's lots of companies we stand out. But how do you survive that? How do you operate in that world? And I've done it successfully for 15 years. So um, somehow I've done it. If you have perfectionist leaders around you or you are a perfectionist, you're going to have to deal with the underlying things that are causing you to be that way, which probably have a lot to do, not always, with your parental environment, how you were raised. Were you accepted for who you were and then asked to do good work? Or was the quality of your work your only path to acceptance? So here we verge more into Dr. K's space. Um, most of you know Dr. Kanagia, who runs Healthy Gamer underscore GG as a Twitch channel. But if you don't, now you do. Um, the point is, if you were raised to always question your own work in a negative light, that's either going to make you unhappy. It may make you great, but you'll be great and unhappy. Or you're going to have to separate your personal value from your work. Because then you can do good work with high standards, but not hate yourself if it falls short. And not depend on the feedback of others to feel worthwhile. Um, so this is like um, peer pressure. Uh this is like peer pressure from junior high 
from school brought forward into the workplace only as opposed to it being like you're not cool and you didn't make the football team or you're not dressed the way we think you should be dressed it becomes about your work and you feel bad about yourself because others are picky and finding ways to nitpick relentlessly high standards so what do you do step one easy to say you're going to need to see a therapist to do it or work on it yourself a lot over time. Um, separate your self-worth from your work performance. I push people here all the time on ways to be better at your career, to follow the magic loop, to grow, to get promoted, to take risks, to learn new skills, and I'm perfectly fine with that. But every one of you, yes, this will be a surprise. Hey, Shadow, welcome in. This will be a surprise to all of you because uh, some of you will make immediate lying in the basement covered with Cheeto dust jokes. You're all worthwhile people just as who you are, whether you ever do another thing or not. You're wonderful human beings because all humans have value. In a career sense, then you can do things to achieve and that's a way to earn money, but you need to separate your self-worth as a human being from perfect work and if somebody criticizes it or not. So that's thing one. I now gave you a year of work in like one sentence or maybe a decade of work. It's taken me a decade. See again the fact that I have a two-year-old plan that I showed a second ago about trying to... Uh, <laughs> Pentaquan's going to stop with his Cheetos. Yes, Cheetos are a sign of depravity. There's no question. Fighting Pickles, thank you for the 100 bits. So I don't know if this book is on my book list that T Weirdo just popped up, but it should be. There's a book that um, Awesome just read called 10% uh, Happier by Dan Harris. And I will bring this up um, even if, uh, let's see, Amazon 10% Happier Dan Harris. You can click through my book list always and get it. But let's see if it's there. Oh, I found it on Audible. That's not really what I want. So we're going to close that. Come on. All right. So this guy, I've talked about him before. Man, if you want to read about someone who's way more hard charging than I will ever be and what he did about it, this guy, Dan Harris, um, wrote this book, 10% Happier. And it's this story of, this is really interesting, how I tamed the voice in my head, reduced stress without, important, without losing my edge and found self-help that actually works. So if you want psychology in a box, in a book or in an audio book, by all means, do this. Um, <clears throat> use that. So, there you go. Okay. Hmm. Okay, so I hope you guys are asking some questions. Oh, Shadow, you need it. Shadow Fox is in the line of fire right now. Let's, let's give her some support. She works in um, community management for a company that took a, a Black Lives Matter, a pro Black Lives Matter stance, and she's on the driving end of... of uh, she's on the receiving end of all the shitty feedback. So that's a hard role to be, is to be essentially the customer support person. Um, in her case, the community manager, when some of the community is, is saying things, um, uh, saying things that are real nasty. Um, if you, uh, let me see if I can find this. It was on Twitter. Um, it was the most amazing thing. Uh, Bezos. Uh, Bezos got this letter that was just unbelievable. I'm going to see if I can pull it up real quick. Um, it, it may not be there anymore. Um, no, I think it was on his Instagram. Anyway, basically this guy wrote in and said, how dare you be pro Black Lives Matter used the N-word a bunch and said, I'm never shopping with you again. It was just horrible. 
Like this guy was a, he was the worst kind of troll. So, okay, I talked about a book you can get and what to do. Now, what do you do if you have a perfectionist boss? Well, here's some real advice. Deliver results. Perfectionists, I know a perfectionist at Amazon who is a relentless critic of kind of everyone. But if you deliver enough actual money to the company, enough results, he goes and focuses his criticism on other people. The way away from a perfectionist boss is to listen to what they're saying in the sense of hear what they want to be different, but not listen to the value judgment of you as a person. Focus it on the work. Even if they say, you suck, you missed your goal, what you need to hear is the work I did did not meet the goal. You depersonalize it. And then you go make sure the work exceeds the goal and they'll stop saying that stuff. But basically, perfectionists go after the weakest link because that's where they see the biggest problem. Um, how much work is enough? Well, this is a good question, Derek. Um, first, how much work is enough depends on are you satisfied with it? And the second is, is that work producing real economic value? If it's producing economic value, um, then the company's making money, you're doing fine. If your work isn't producing economic value, you either need to do more work or different work. Hopefully you can do different work rather than more. But in the end, companies exist to make money and generate results for their customers and then for their shareholders. If your work is doing that well, you're doing enough. If your work is not doing that well, you're not doing enough. Um, <clears throat> is that person willing to see when they're the weakest link? Uh, yes. So a lot of perfectionists are very critical of themselves as well. They're actually eaten up by criticism. A true story is that when I joined Amazon, um, when I joined Amazon, uh, there was a joke that floated around, which is said Amazon is where high performers go to feel bad about themselves. And it took me a little while because I was new to really understand what that mean meant. But I would like to skip that part. Like, I don't want to feel bad about myself. That sounds like a real drag. So the trick in that, that the mental pivot you have to make is decouple your worth from other people's evaluation. Um, and just to connect these dots really clearly, because I haven't done this yet, and then I'll go take some questions because I see a few of you have put them in and you're starting to vote, which I appreciate. Most of us got our perfectionist tendencies if we have them or our vulnerability to criticism or our invulnerability from how our parents and early childhood influences treated us. So if your parents loved you for who you were and then tried to motivate you to do good, you're probably fine. If your parents criticized you for your work, you then associate your self-worth with what you accomplish. And that's what I do. And that's what I'll probably fight all my life. But you can learn to fight it. Second, teachers perpetuate this. If you think about it, you go from being graded by your parents to being graded by your high school teachers to taking entrance exams. Someone here said that their dad is a prof at IIT Delhi to taking the all India entrance exam, which literally stack ranks Indian college students from number one in the nation of 1.3 billion to number whatever, 2 million, and tells you exactly where you fall in the pecking order between best and worst in the eyes of the test, to professors giving you grades, to, ah, bosses giving you performance reviews. It's all the same. Unless you work for yourself and you're very successful at it, you always have someone else judging you and judging your work. And separating those two is really important. You can let other people judge your work. What we tend to do is equate judging our work with judging ourselves. And Americans have the worst problem, I don't know. We have a huge problem with it because we identify so closely our value in life to our work. 
Uh, and I just saw Jers and MC's comment up in chat that says, this doesn't sound healthy. No, it does not sound healthy. We're trying to get more healthy here. So you have to disassociate those. Um, do you think most execs or high performers suffer from perfectionism? Absolutely. Uh, and that's why I wanted to talk about it because we want to be high performers without the downside of perfectionism. We want to strive for high standards in our work without being perfectionists, which has two downsides. First, perfectionists are often unhappy. Second, they often are unable to call a project done or get started on it because they're not sure they can be perfect and succeed. So I've talked about a bunch of stuff. What you do about perfectionism is you do very good work and then you focus on the value. You focus on was this work good enough to generate the result? Perfectionists have this image in their mind that they're striving for. That isn't really interesting. For example, let's take treatment of COVID-19, which we have Liger here and he can talk about for real. And I can talk about perfectionist or not. From the patient's viewpoint, if I leave the hospital alive rather than dead, the treatment was good enough. From a theoretical viewpoint, there's a lot of other concerns. Was it as cheap as possible? Was it as painless as possible? Did the patient recover as quickly as possible? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, those matter. But right now, if you look at having COVID, right? You really care, did you go home alive or not? That's like number one, and it's also numbers two, three, four, and five. And then at number six, you get to like, and was I comfy in the hospital? Um, so understanding when is good enough, good enough, um, you run a startup. Hephaestus runs a startup. Okay, was the work good enough to win the contract and get the doctor, he serves doctors, physicians, to pay and to recommend us to others? If it does that, yay. If it doesn't do that, not yay. Was it Perfectly formatted, perfectly colored, whatever his list of criteria are. I bet, yeah. In a startup, you care about did you get paid and will the customer probably pay you again? And then it's good enough. We have real trouble, though, as perfectionists because we're used to being graded. For example, what they never tell you in a college class, because I know a lot of you are in college and most of you went to college or you're in high school. When they give you an A or a B, what they never tell you is, would your project have met the need in the real world? Would it have gotten you uh, the result in the real world? They never tell you that. They give you a letter grade, and the letter grade can always be higher. Unless you are the number one in the school, your grade can always be higher. Uh, all right, question for the sake of argument. What if your feedback cycle on value is long? Great question. So, um, <clears throat> I'm thinking about that question. If I'm saying judge on value and the value takes a long time to manifest, you need the early signals of value somehow. You need the indicators. Um, or you need to decide as you would do, because in, in your world, Pentaquan is a venture capitalist. You go with a portfolio strategy. You go with a venture portfolio strategy where um, you place multiple bets. Uh, so that's a really interesting point, Pinaquan. You could always hunt around for the one perfect investment, but since you can't know what the one perfect investment is, you instead make six that you think are pretty good and count on one of them to turn out and cover the others. Yeah, which is a type, as Hephaestus says, of educated projections. My profs always say that if it isn't 100, then it wouldn't fly in industry. Well, that's why they say those that can do and those that can't teach. All right. So this has been fun. I see some of you have voted. Feel free to put in other questions on other topics as well. Um, anything, though, about working in the workplace, dealing with perfectionism in yourself or others, I would prefer to answer your questions 
than just talk randomly. So I'm going to jump into questions. There's a good one here a lot of people want to talk about. And then if we run out of stuff, I will go over to the slide deck awesome created for this and we'll go through a little bit of that. But the first question up is, how do you treat people with kindness and respect yet still maintain assertiveness if they may mistake your kindness for weakness? And this was asked last week. I may have talked about it a little bit, but I kept the question because I thought it was really good. And obviously a lot of people here are interested in it. So thank you for voting uh, on our questions. Um, so if someone mistakes your kindness for weakness, there's a missing detail there. Basically, that means they try to do something to run over you, probably. Like I'm, I'm extrapolating from your question a little bit. But if someone um, is treating you badly uh, because they think you're a pushover, you can show them you're not without, again, being mean. I, I talked about this. Um, maybe it was on a show last week, but it may have been an internal Amazon training class, actually. There was a woman I knew who worked at Amazon um, she was a relatively small woman, relatively quiet. So she wasn't going to win on physical stature. But when people made her mad, she actually suddenly spoke more softly. And the madder they got her, the more they offended her, the quieter and quieter she got. The point being, if they started to mistake her stature or her demeanor as weakness, um, she just got really quiet. Yeah, I talked about this last week. Okay, the other thing that works really well is just silence. If someone says something ridiculous, you just stare at them. And most people try it sometime. Most people cannot stand eye contact. If you just make a face that says, really? And just look at them and hold that eye contact, they will apologize. They're, or they'll get really angry and make a fool of themselves. But you can just basically stare people down. That said, um, you can always be respectful. I believe that um, if you maintain respect, uh, even if you need to tell someone, I'm sorry, that's not okay with me, what you said is unacceptable or what you did, or perhaps you've mistaken that just because I'm being polite, I don't have a point of opinion and that I'm accepting what you're saying, but I'm not. You can be, though, very calm and still contradict people. So what I would say here is you have to just, this is a little bit like perfectionism in the sense that you have to separate how you behave, which is with kindness and respect, from what you allow. This is basically the idea of boundaries. Um, you can be nice and still have boundaries. Uh, so that's an example. Um, and by the way, this stuff's hard. Uh, a lot of us want to say yes to people. We want them to like us. You have to be okay with the fact that if you make a boundary with someone, they may no longer like you and they may even try to punish you for it. They may even try to guilt trip you and say, well, you're so nice to everyone else. Why are you giving me static? Right and try and flip it back on you. Remember, uh, there's a blog someone quotes a lot that says all humans are status-seeking monkeys. What I would say about that is we're all incredibly well-wired to try and get what we want emotionally, whether or not it's rational, and we have all kinds of tricks, guilt, peer pressure, um, threats, uh, clever language and arguments, physical intimidation, verbal intimidation, racism, all of these are different ways that different people use to try and get leverage. Um, because most people are lazy about getting what they want and rather than talking to another human and making it a win-win situation, they'd rather control them. And I won't claim I'm proof against this. We all get lazy about trying to control, yeah. Renee says he gets loud. A lot of people do that. 
Yes, yeah, status is a proxy for money, attention, respect, etc. Okay, great question. Let's go to the next question. Um, I started a new job and I'm having trouble adapting to my manager's hands-off approach. Do you have any advice or tips to work effectively? Sure. Most people, by the way, many people in chat, they can sound off if they want, would dream of being having a hands-off approach from a manager. However, recognize that this is like a no-win situation. Um, unless a manager balances it somehow magically perfectly, they're either too hands-off and you feel neglected and ignored, or they're too hands-on uh, and you feel micromanaged. So first realize it's very hard to hit the sweet spot. And uh, Dr. Miller, I'm glad I'm glad you like uh, I like I'm glad you like the painting. So first thing is get good at being flexible in what sort of management style you can work with. When I teach managers. Um, when I teach managers, I tell them they need to be chameleons. They need to be able to work with people of different styles. But all of you want coaching about how to succeed in your career. You will work for managers who ignore you. You will also work for managers who micromanage you. The better you are at operating between the ones that ignore you and the ones that micromanage you and being comfortable anywhere in there, and bringing them to where you want them to be, the more successful you'll be. So thing number one, build your skills at being flexible. Thing number two, if your manager is too hands off, do what Hephaestus said, which is ask for feedback. But also um, tell them what you need and why and ask them basically Tell them what you need and why, but also figure out what they need and why. Are they hands off because they're busy? Are they hands off because they don't know how to do what you do and so they feel incompetent? Are they hands off because they don't really give a, give a damn and they just want to go home at the end of the day? Understanding the why will help you manage through because if they just want to be left alone, you may have to cope. If they don't know how to do what you do and don't know how to advise you, that's a different problem. If they're just busy, you can ask them how you can help them. Um, maybe they just think you need more space than you have and they can adapt. So what I would say is you ask them to adapt to you, dear boss. I'm a little bit higher touch and I'm new in this job. I'm not feeling super confident. Do you think you could give me more regular feedback? Maybe if I reminded you, that's a very adult request. A different request that's even better is right now, while I'm new at the job, some extra feedback would help me do better work for you. Do you think that would be okay? Very few managers will say like, no, actually, I don't ever want to give you feedback. It's too bad you're new. Figure it out or F off. If they say that, you know it's time to F off and go look for a different job. So, um, <laughs> that's super funny. Uh, Andrea underscore V, where is this magic loop info? Magic loop is something we talk about a lot on the channel here. I'll run it down for you super quick. Um, so the magic loop is my five-step plan to advance your career under general circumstances. It works 100% of the time. If you come to our Discord and go to career success, you'll see story after story of people that um, uh, of people who have used the magic loop to success. So, magic loop has five steps. Number one, do your basic job well. So if you have a job and it's got assigned work or you're given work. Do that work diligently and well. Number two, once you've done the work well and verified with your boss or whoever that you've done it well, number two, go to your boss and say, hey, I'm doing my job well. What else can I help you with? What else do you need? What else would help you or help the company succeed? Um, number three, uh, go do whatever he says or she says. 
One of the worst things you can do is ask your boss what they need done and say, oh, I didn't mean that. I don't want to do that. Once you ask, you better follow through. Number four, after you've done that, go back to your boss and say, okay, I'd like to grow my career this way. I'd like to grow my career that way. I'd like to develop this skill or learn this thing. Um, how do I do that? Uh, sorry. Is there a way I can help the team while doing that? So is there a way I can have a project since I've been helpful and I've shown I can do more that would advance my goals too? And number five, once they say what it is, go do that. Then you repeat steps four and five. Basically, most people never come to their boss and ask them, uh, how can I help you? What can I do to make you successful? What can I do to make the company more successful? Most of your peers sit around, um, muddle through the day randomly with what they've been told to do or what they imagine they should do. Uh, oh, that's a good point, Pashi. I can put up a definition somewhere we can just refer people to. That's super smart. I will do that on my website, if not in Discord. Thank you. Um, that said, what most people do is they sit around and wait to be told what to do. It's the rare person that goes and asks, how can I help? And bosses love that. And we do this all the time. Some of you asked this question are new here. But anyone who's a manager of personnel in chat 100% agrees. They love being asked how to get help. Uh, what can help them, and they never they aren't asked nearly enough. So if you just do those two things, you stand out, and we have people all the time uh, that do that. Oh, I, uh, T Weirdo's right. I could just, it's probably too long for a chat command. Um, Sean123 ran his own startup until recently. I agree, nobody asks. Be prepared, though, if you ask, you will be given work. 100% true. If you ask for the opportunity to do more, Almost every boss will say, oh, God, I have tons. Um, look, one person explained it to me this way. When you interact with your boss, you're either everyone is doing one of two things. They're either bringing a bag of shit into the boss's office and trying to put it on the boss's desk and saying, I have a problem and I want to give it to you. We're low on supplies. The, the construction permit didn't come through. We failed the audit. They want to bring the bag of shit and drop it on your desk. Or they're coming into the office and saying, hey, I've done my work. What can I help you with? And they're picking up a bag of shit that someone else left and taking it and handling it. Now, when it comes time for promotion, pay, raises, accolades, opportunities, who do you think the boss is going to think of? The people who bring them bags of shit and leave them or the people who pick up bags of shit and take them. So maybe maybe our next channel icon will be a bag of shit because that's really that's how the work world is, is you're either taking or leaving bags of shit. And I would recommend be someone who picks them up and takes care of them. Uh, it could be from a book. Um <laughs> I'm working on a book. I use uh, I use talking here as a way to refine the ideas that will one day show up in my great magnum opus. And so, yes, someday I will I will explain the, this simple. I heard it from another manager, and I've remembered it for a long time. All right. Uh, next question. We have good questions here, so keep them coming in chat. I love the questions. I'd rather answer. I'm sorry. Keep them coming in our tool. Keep voting because I'd rather answer your questions than, uh, you know, I only talk about topics to like open the stream and give something. All right. Give a starting point. Next question is, as a manager in a corporate company, if an employee comes to you looking for help because they're going through a rough time, is it better to keep pretending that you are strong and make it seem like nothing gets you so that you maintain a strong morale or should you be empathetic and vulnerable? Oh, this is a really um, easy question. Um, you should totally be empathetic uh, and vulnerable. And now's a good time for this, right? There's a lot of employees going through tough times either because of COVID or because of Black Lives Matter or something else, all the things that normally happen in life, divorce, death, 
you know, loss of a loved one, kid having problems in school. The list is endless. Who are you going to work harder for? The boss who seems like a tower of strength and gives you advice or the boss who cares about you and tries to help you as a person, right? To me, that's no contest. Um, And it's funny because, of course, on Twitch, the biggest skill I have is giving you advice because I have expertise and you all are interested in it. But the most value and the people who follow this stream and come back every week are the ones I've been able to interact with and help with their lives in some way, whether I've helped them with their resume or their work or teaching them the magic loop and help them get a promotion. The people who come back every week are the ones where I've made a difference in their lives. So in answer to this question, you want to try and make a positive difference in somebody's life and they will bust their ass for you. So that will create strong morale because then you'll have someone out in the team who says, hey, um, this guy uh, or this woman, she has my back. I'm going to stick with her. And if someone's criticizing them, they'll actually step up and say, why are you down on Fred or Ethan or Sally, whoever it is? Why are you down on them? They do all these good things. You need to go talk to them and they'll help you out. Or you need to ask for clarification. The strongest advocate a manager can have is nothing they say. It's what your employees say about you behind your back. And uh, 40 Pink Dragons is here, was, is better at this than I am. Uh, I know a lot about her team because I've met her workplace team. They would run through walls for her. She's been gone from her job her last job where I knew her team really well for like three years. And those people still want to get together and ask her advice and go to the bar with her um, and miss her and wish she'd come back. And it's because she took care of them as humans. So that's my advice here. So now we're down to only questions with one vote. And I don't normally rush to do one vote questions. So if there's something you want me to talk about, let me know. Meanwhile, I'm going to go take a quick minute And look at the stuff, the other parts on perfectionism that uh, I may not have covered. Because the thing I think about perfectionism you need to understand is it's either in you or all around you. And unless it's the positive type, the purely positive, we're all going to strive for high goals together. If it's the negative, critical, emotionally attacking type, you need to learn to fight it. Um, And a lot of that may be inside yourself. You may need to start with learning to be different internally about how you let others' judgment hurt you. Um, In the end, by the way, others' opinions are nice, but you all know this. It's just very hard advice to take. The opinions of others are good for information. They're not good for your emotions if they're negative. Sure, if they're positive, that's great, but nobody likes endless criticism of them as a person. So... All right. What else? Um, Perfectionism gets in your way. Um, It gets in your way in the sense that perfectionists often can't start tasks because they're not sure they can do it perfectly. They can't finish tasks because they're not satisfied. Um, People who aim for perfect often miss deadlines and opportunities. Uh, Executives, um, they won't submit work because they never see it as good enough. Um, Look, Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, I'll tell you one of my favorite stories here. I like war history. Um, And uh, George Washington, um, most people don't realize this unless they've studied the American Revolution a little bit. He lost almost every battle he was in. So uh, he retreated from, from almost every battle he was in. But he kept his army together and he caused the British to have to keep fighting a war that was far away from their home and expensive. And as a result, eventually the British got tired of that. They stopped supplying enough troops and Washington was able to force a surrender and ultimately win the freedom of our country. Um, But he did it by mostly losing. That was good enough. 
Yeah, read this book. I've read it. Same one, Pentaquan, 1776. It's an incredible book that explains this. All right. Um, let's see. So the question you ask, I'll just try and address quickly because it's kind of fun. How do I fight the perfectionism inside me? First thing, if he's still here, ask Liger. Because uh, Liger is in the same world working on a PhD. Second, um, look, you you have to realize that the professors can give you help about your work, but they don't get to decide whether or not you're a good human. So uh, you feel like you need to be delivering more when you're asking for resources. Maybe you do, but it's, remember, this is a surprise, and many professors don't behave this way, but professors are there to teach you. That's actually their job. The job of a professor, most professors think their job is to advance their own research and get grants because that's what the economic system teaches them. Their actual job is to teach students. Now, not all of them do that, but you should feel free to make reasonable requests for help because that's their damn job. If they respond poorly to that, one of the biggest things I had to realize is so much of the criticism I get in my life, because I get some, is because someone else has an issue. So remember we were talking about how perfectionists, their mama was mean to them or their daddy and gave them very high standards and criticized them? If that perfectionist attacks me, I can either feel bad about my work or I can feel sorry for them that their mommy was mean to them. It's much better without being patronizing to realize oftentimes criticism, particularly mean criticism, is rooted in that other person having an issue. Sometimes you can see that issue and figure it out like, oh, that person was abused as a child or that person was an orphan or that person whatever. But when you can figure out that can help but even if you can't figure it out look at the criticism objectively and say okay can i make my work better do i have the ability the time do i need to i'll go make my work better because my work can always be improved and i welcome feedback on my work but if they're attacking me that's their problem usually i mean if i've done something horrible right if i've abducted and dismembered the neighborhood pets Maybe I need some criticism, but if I haven't done that, then maybe it's someone else's problem. All right. Uh, it really helps to hear that. My mommy literally gave me literally no standards, which is why I'm a perfectionist. We have no concept of good enough. Yes. So that's the reverse. If you have no idea what's good enough, you have to form that yourself. Um, but realize that's your work to do then. Some of the hardest work to do is if you're used to using other people, and I have this problem. I'll sign up. I'm first. My hand is up. If you're used to counting on other people and using other people's standards for good enough, some of the hardest work you're going to have to do is start deciding for yourself. You've been weak. If first it was your parents who gave you your standards, then your high school teachers, then your professors, and then your bosses, you have never developed the muscle to decide what is good enough on your own. And that muscle is so valuable and awesome. That's, that's for you since you helped create this deck. You have to build the muscle to have your own standards for yourself that you believe in, not other people's standards and not standards that are impossible just because someone told you they should be. All right. We have some more questions in because I beg, borrowed, and browbeat. So we'll take the next one. How do you manage a relationship with a coworker who has relentlessly high standards and doesn't concede arguments to peers, only concedes to the manager with pressure on the whole team that they're doing the wrong thing just for speed? Well, I try and talk to the manager um, and see if the manager can help with that. Uh, the other thing, though, is do you need this coworker to concede? 
In other words, high standards are great. Unreasonably high standards are not as great. But do you have to care? If the coworker is not the boss, maybe the right thing to do is get used to saying, as opposed, yeah, why Pashi says, why are you arguing with coworkers? He's actually right. Instead, say, thank you for that input. Yeah, but you have to do blah, blah, blah. Actually, I don't. But thank you for that input. Just become a broken record. Get your. It's even better if your peers do it. Oh, yeah, thank you for that input. Uh-huh. Oh, thank you. We'll consider that. I'm being a patronizing dick about it for emphasis, but just sincerely say, well, we're going to have to disagree about that, but I do appreciate it, and I have thought about what you've said. You don't have to do what they say. All right, literally got his got his thing, and now you know he, he got his question answered, and he's out. Well, I hope you follow and come back after you've had some sleep. Literally, um, and by the way, I'm not criticizing you. I'm just poking fun. I really am glad to have you here. Plus, you're a Twitch Prime member, and I love Twitch Prime. So, uh, let's see, what else do we have here? We have another question. It's got a lot of votes. Let's do it. How do you deal with lack of motivation or burnout after being a perfectionist for a while? Oh, boy. Um, The list is long. Therapy. Um, So I joke about that, but actually it's not completely wrong. If you have a way to get some counseling or some help with it, go do that. Uh, But more than that, just take a break. Um, If you can get away from work, if you can... Most people are not perfectionists about every issue. For example, I can be a perfectionist about some types of work. But uh, yeah, and if you can't afford therapy, go watch uh, Healthy Gamer underscore GG. It's like free discussion of issues. It's not therapy. We'll talk like nobody says that because he can't do therapy online. But go watch Healthy Gamer GG for discussion of relevant issues in a very cogent fashion. Um, Anyway. Uh, lack of motivation and burnout, the only way to do that is go decompress somewhere and rebuild your emotional reserves. Um, What people don't realize, particularly smart people, and many of you here are extremely smart, you believe that your intelligence is what gets you through life and gives you your energy, but it's not. Actually, we're powered by our emotions. And if you don't believe that, um, think about how much more energy you have when you're angry than how much more energy you have when you think you're smart. When you think you're smart, you're kind of like feeling good and puffing your chest out. But when you're angry, you're full of energy. When you're in love, you're full of energy. Uh, Emotions power energy. Uh, The other thing uh, Renee says, it's absolutely right. Take care of yourself physically. Um, Just like emotions power our energy and solve burnout, so so does our body. It's a real tragedy, one I have often regretted, but it turns out my brilliant brain is attached to a very hungry, lazy, tired meat sack that if I don't take care of the meat sack, the brain doesn't work very well. So get enough sleep, eat good food, get exercise, Emotions power energy and taking care of your physical body powers energy. Uh, It would be great if uh, some people think this would be horrible. As a computer scientist, I don't. It would be great if all of my personality and brain could be uploaded into a machine that would run forever and never get tired, never age and never die. We haven't figured that out yet. The singularity is coming, blah, 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 but it's not here. So this is how you have to go solve that in the meantime, um, which is take care of your body. So all this advice here is good, but you're going to have to get some distance and take care of yourself. Amazon's new AI. Yes, later. All right. I still think it's funny. I'll never be able to forget it. One of my stream editors said he can tell when I'm drinking because I go silent on the stream. He doesn't even need to. He just can look at the voice track and know when I'm taking a drink. Um, all right. Uh, 
so we have a, I'm going to look at the other questions real quick. Um, let me go back to the deck though and see what else we should talk about on this topic. If you have other questions, get them in. Oh, we didn't talk about imposter syndrome. So hopefully some of you know what imposter syndrome is. Imposter syndrome is basically this feeling. Uh, women have it more than men, but lots of people get it, which is if only people knew the real me, they would not accept me. They would not have hired me. I wouldn't be in this school. If people ever find out who I really am, um, they won't love me. They won't have me on their team. They won't have me at this workplace, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, a lot of people have this feeling. I see it in chat. You're sounding off. And I appreciate you being vulnerable to be truthful about it. I have this feeling sometimes too. First thing to realize is lots of people feel this way. Second thing is um, everyone has their hidden secrets where they feel inadequate. Inadequacy drives so much of what we do. Trying to cover our own inadequacy drives so much of how we behave. But imposter syndrome is about is related to perfectionism because we believe, well, if I can achieve perfection, then I'll be worthy. So again, it's this conflating self-worth with work performance. And you have to tear these apart. Your career worth, how much money you should be paid, might be related to your job performance. Your Value as an intrinsic human being with good motives and whatever, you can't let that be tied to work performance alone because here's why. Why? All of us will get old and die or we'll get young and die. doesn't matter. Eventually, all of your accomplishments are going to be taken away from you by old age, by disease, by tragedy, by something. You better have something else that makes you worth burying and writing on your headstone because all your work will go away. Um, and I know that really sucks. Uh, and believe me, I've spent a whole career building up a pile of work accomplishments. But in the end, nothing about my work accomplishments will be written there. Um, <clears throat> so, <clears throat> the staff was just passing me a question. So, I have a great support staff here. Karmic deep. Yeah, it is deep. So look, so much. Um, it turns out, by the way, I want to get excited about this. Maybe we haven't had a rant yet. So it's time to stand up and rant about it. Being emotionally healthy because emotions drive your energy. Being emotionally healthy at work will not only make you a better coworker, it will make you a more effective worker. If you can get over all these hangups that we're talking about, imposter syndrome, it's a hangup, it's a type of self-doubt. Um, perfectionism, it's a hangup, it's a type of self-doubt. Uh, it's a type of value problem. Being criticized a lot and letting that hurt you. If you can become emotionally stronger, and again, go see Healthy Gamer GG about how to do that. If you can become emotionally stronger, you will be more successful. So never think of investing in your own emotions as weakness um, or at, which I did, I'm guilty. Never think of making yourself emotionally more healthy or managing your emotions as not work it actually makes you better at work. And so what I would say here is get, get good at liking yourself and being reasonably comfortable with who you are and you will be a better coworker and more effective. Um, there's a book I haven't read, I need to read, that's called um, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. And some of you may have read it. If you're here in chat, you can talk about it. Um, but... I like this title because the better I've gotten about not giving a damn, the more effective I've become at work. You can be braver, 
you can take more risks, you can deal with more failure. Uh, so Im investing in your emotional health and literacy is certain worth your time and investment. Here's the thing, this is a great question. How many years have you invested in schooling? Put a number in, we'll just talk about, uh, we'll count at the beginning of high school. So if you're in your first year of high school, that's year one. If you have a PhD, that's gonna be like year 12. If you have more than that, even more. How many years have you put into your education starting with the beginning of high school? Yeah, 12 plus five. So you're 17 years of education or 12 years in high school and then five in college. Go ahead, keep the numbers coming. And for me, if I count from the beginning of high school, my number, um, I punched out at 10 years. So I did my undergrad. So I did high school, which is four, and college, which was four, and a master's degree, which was 1.5. Actually, I can't add. Uh, so I punched out at 11, because I did PhD at 1.5. So I had 11 years, not 10. It's too bad after 11 years, I can't count to 10 um, or to 11. But here's the point. Now, switch over. This will be our magic dividing line in chat right here. Switch over and tell me how many years you've spent uh, being trained in your emotional health or investing in learning how to manage and be a whole person and be confident. Okay. I can actually say... I don't know, maybe two. Destiny waits. Good job. Um, one, a quarter, less than one. Okay, so do you see the imbalance here? Uh, and Derek Bunch, you've done good work. Um, people have invested half a decade or a decade in schooling, and maybe between zero and two years. We have a high water mark of four. Like we have someone, Derek, who's a PhD in self-investment and emotional resilience. Um, and Derek, I'd love for you to share more in chat about what you've done. But you see the problem. We have a lot of really smart people here who aren't, who haven't developed a lot of EQ, uh, which is emotional intelligence. So, so that would be my ending message. Invest in your emotional stability. Actually, if you go to my book list, which people pop up all the time, I will go there as well real quick. Uh, a lot of my books are essentially self-help books because they help you build your emotional intelligence. So I actually live by this, right? My number, these top books here, Leadership and Self-Deception, The Anatomy of Peace, The Outward Mindset, these are all about understanding human relationships at work. Um, <clears throat> these are not decisive is, is about better decision making. But some of these, like the power of moments, they're again about um, improving uh, how you manage a team and how, how emotions work at work. The book Switch is all about the power of emotions. It's where I learned that emotions drive performance, intellect does not. So half those books are on, um, uh, half of those books are on emotional management. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People is probably part emotion. One Minute Manager is part relating to people. Uh, Peopleware is certainly 100% about how you relate to people. The next two aren't. Um, I Moved Your Cheese is about emotion. Uh, who Moved Your Cheese or Who Moved My Cheese is not so much, but I Moved Your Cheese is again about your motivation. Um, the point that Deepak writes about is that uh, whether or not your cheese got moved depends like whether or not you care depends on how much you give a damn about cheese uh so he had a great point all right so we've covered enough i will now do the speed run of remaining questions so it's time to drink up we'll do that we'll call it a night i will be back next wednesday i can't do a tuesday show next week um I'm going to dinner at a friend's um but I will be back next Wednesday. 
Awesome is already working on our topic for that night. Let's see. Uh, we chose a topic. He's going to do some of the work. I'm going to do some of the work on what we want to say about it. We're going to talk about career pivots, how to change careers, how to change what job you're in, how to move from software developer to TPM. It's a common one I'm asked about, how to move into product management. We're going to talk about how to pivot your career if you're mid-career um, and want to change what you're doing. I'm sure that's going to be a super hot topic. In the meantime, we're going to hit question one. Uh, let me go back to me. All right. Question one. What if you are singularly responsible for their entire digital platform, but it is not enough? Uh, well, it depends on how big your company is. <laughs> no, seriously, it's a little bit lacking framing. If you were responsible for Amazon's entire digital platform, that damn well better be enough. Um, but look, uh, it, I'm assuming what you're hinting here is this is a valuable job, but people aren't valuing you. Remember, they need to value your work. You need to be confident in your own value separately. What I would do in this case, though, is I would discuss the value of the work and I would try to understand why is this work not seen as valuable? Uh, so, <clears throat> and I should be clear, by the way, uh, the awesome in question, we talk about awesome Dave. He's not here tonight. I'm talking about this awesome who is here. And his real actual name is Awesome Patel. But he seems to have maybe left for the night. There he is. Um, he's the guy who makes these. We also have an awesome day, but awesome's actual legal first name is awesome. In answering this question, which I've now failed to speed run, but I will get back after it. I would go talk to my manager about what he values and why. Go ask questions. It's part of the magic loop. What is most important to you? I'm working on our platform uh, and I own all of it. Is that the most valuable thing I can be doing or is there something else? Find out what the mindset is. And then if they're screwed up in the head, just leave. Uh, but if they're not, maybe you're valuing something they're not or they're not valuing it because you're doing it so well, in which case, ask questions. Okay, next question. How can I get back into the workforce? I haven't worked in around six months and I have one to two years of experience. When interviewing, it seems like what I did at my previous job is not the kind of project they look for. Could a passion project help? Yes, a passion project can help. Second, six months is not that long, although only having one to two years of experience is not that much. So it's a little bit of a trade-off. I don't know what you do. Um, to get back into the workforce right now, though, as a new person, uh, there's a couple people in chat I know who are hunting for jobs. You're going to need to bust your ass and hustle. And if you haven't read the book Jia Jiang by Jia Jiang called um, Rejection Proof, you need to read Rejection Proof and you need to read um, What Color Is My Parachute and Bust Your Ass Job Hunting. It's going to take lots and lots of work because we're in a recession with lots of unemployed people and they're all competing for the same job. So the prize is going to go to the person who works the hardest and works the smartest. So... How can you get back into the workforce? Have a good plan, have a good resume, bust your ass. This is one where hard work is going to be just as valuable as anything else you can do. Um, because you don't know who's going to hire you and it's um, Pentaquant, if he's still here, said, what do you do when your feedback cycle is long? You never get a straight answer about why you didn't get hired. So you just need to put your best effort out there and try lots of places. I've been out of work earlier in my career and had no idea when I was going to get hired. And you just, the faster you try and the more places you try, do not fall into the send your resume one place, wait two weeks and hope they respond. Send your resume to a second place, wait two weeks. Oh, they called me, wait four weeks. Be working on 20 jobs at, in parallel. It's a portfolio strategy. The job search is a numbers game. I haven't met you yet, Derek, but you are right. Welcome to the channel. 
Okay. Um, we've already answered this singularly responsible question, so we can skip it. How to deal with a boss that doesn't like you, even though you do the work better than others? Um, are you a likable person? First, um, bosses sometimes dislike people for no reason or seem to. Uh, but I always, as a boss, I always love these people who think I'm secretly hating on them for no reason. Look at yourself first. Not in a critical way, just be honest. Are you difficult? Are you a complainer? Are you late a lot? You say you do the work better than others. Do you really? Maybe. Okay, so let's assume that I'm a bad boss now and I'm the one who's skeptical of you. I'll stop. What's your boss's problem? What does he like? Go ask him what he wants. You believe you're doing the work better than others. Go ask the boss. If it then turns out your boss is just a jerk, try to leave. But what I find is that how these folks who write this question, how do you deal with a boss that don't like you even though you do the work better than others? They feel that at every job they go to. In other words, the pattern I see is that this boss hates me and that boss hates me and this boss was... Uh, this boss had favorites and that boss had favorites. At some point, you're the common element. Now, if you feel like I'm just one more boss, I don't even know you. So why would I dislike you? I just, victim attitude sucks. Uh, and what you're doing is saying, I'm a victim. I'm a victim. My boss doesn't like me, even though I'm the best. Well, maybe. Maybe you're the most egotistical. So I'd go take a hard look in the mirror and then I go try and figure out and ask the boss what they really want and see who they really do, quote unquote, like. And then if it really isn't about you, I'd move. But if you have the same problem with the next boss and the next boss, if this is the third boss where you feel this way, it's you. Um, and yeah, sometimes they feel threatened, change bosses. Some bosses do feel threatened. If you're a high performer working hard and you're in a shitty company with very little growth, they will feel threatened. Go to a high growth company. If you're, if you want to be a high performer, try not to work at the post office. There is no place for a high performer at the post office. You're only going to make other people unhappy. What are you doing working overtime? Why are you in such a hurry? You're going to make us all look bad. If you're in a company full of people who want to do as little as possible, get the hell out because it's a sucky company. Unless you want to be that person. Okay, if you're the sort of person who wants to sneak out and do as little as possible, then go, definitely go to the post office. But, and I'm sorry, if there's some postal worker here, I'm stereotyping, blah, 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 sorry. But still, there's not really a role at the post office for a career climber. There's a role for people who carry the mail every day and do it well, but that's about it, unless you're going to become the postmaster. And there's only one postmaster, and they get threatened. So, if you want to be high achieving, go somewhere where that's welcome. Um, all right, moving on. Any advice for getting over that starting paralysis that comes from the fear of falling short of standards you set for yourself? Sure. What I do is I try to just start. I try to do anything on the project. I don't tell myself I have to finish it yet. I open the document. I put in the title page. I take one step on it. I write a paragraph. Whatever it is I have to do, I buy the materials if I'm going to build something. Get started without worrying about the end. In other words, separate the two. There's this really interesting idea uh, a woman came up with. Um, she was trying to advise people how to clean their messy houses. And people feel overwhelmed. They see a house that's very messy and they're like, oh, I can't deal with all this crap. The floor is dirty. The dishes need done. She came up with this idea called the five minute room rescue. Well, you can do this for a project. So we will um, call it the five minute project rescue in this context. Don't tell yourself you'll finish. Tell yourself, I'm going to do five minutes of work on this project to get started. And then I'm going to have a cookie or a beer or whatever. Um, if that's your mindset, what you'll find is once you do five minutes, you've broken the dam and you can go start. 
What this woman realized was once people cleaned for five minutes, they felt better about how things looked and they felt like they could go um, make more progress and it didn't feel as hopeless because it turned out that they could throw all the dishes in the dishwasher in five minutes or they could clean up all their kids' junk and throw it in the trash can. And then the room looked a little bit better and they felt better. And you get on that positive endorphin rush. And maybe you work for 15 minutes, maybe you work for an hour. That's how you break the paralysis. It's um, psychological. All right. The bird abides is right. Overwork is often over-celebrated. But Renee is even more right. Results are celebrated more. Overwork is what you do when you're not sure how to show your results. Basically, if we could all show good enough results, we'd be like, mic drop, I made all the money. I won the game. I got the A's. Mic drop, I'm done. We're trained in college. Think about this. Most of you are in college or have gone to college. What do they tell you to do when you're not sure how to solve the problem? They actually teach you this. Do as much work as you can for partial credit. How many of you have gotten the whole partial credit lecture? Yes. Yes. Thunderpants, what is it? Med? MCD? Thunderpants MCD. Put something down. That's what they teach you. Put something down for partial marks. This is school teaches us a lot, but also screws us up. And what it teaches us is that you can get partial marks in life for hard effort. Oh, yeah. Actually, our company went out of business, but you were there sharpening pencils like a beast. It doesn't work that way. But we get taught, if we're not sure what else to do, work harder, because that's visible. Hard work matters because a lot of results take hard work. But we get sucked into this idea of partial effort, partial results, partial credit. And ah, that just isn't true. It's, it's, it's true that, look, I just said start something and do five minutes on it. So clearly I believe getting started and doing partial work towards eventually finishing is good. But the credit is for finishing. This isn't like graded on a curve. Not really. It's either done or it's not done. All right. We'll keep speed running questions. Off topic, how can you tell the real performance of workers that work from home? Um, I bet some people are just doing good enough so the boss doesn't get angry. Maybe. Um, I'm the boss. I have 200 people and we haven't had that problem. There's actually all kinds of... Um, there's all kinds of ways I can tell if you're working. I can tell if you're showing up to meetings. I can look at, we do software mostly, so I can tell what you're checking in, uh, how, how, many, how much code you're checking in. Um, I can tell uh, how many sprint points your team is completing. But if we go outside of even technology, either I or your peers know. The only way you can really do this is if you work with an inattentive boss where results are very unclear, in which case, see earlier argument. Um, you're working at a place. There are places where just scraping by is good enough. Like when I was a kid, my grandfather told me a story, and this wasn't why I was picking on the post office, but it reminded me. He told me a story of a guy who did an old walking on your feet postal route. And that guy, uh, he was getting done with his route too soon. So what he would do is every day in the middle of the day, he would go to the park and he would light a cigar and put it between his fingers. And then he would put it on his chest or hang it over the edge of a bench and lay down and take a nap. And that cigar took a long time to burn down to where his fingers got hot and woke him up. So he was using it like a timer to time like a 45 minute nap in the park. And he knew that if he got back to the post office too early, they would just give him more streets to cover. So his thought was, I don't want to do more walking. I'd rather do more sleeping. 
So he bought a cigar every day and slept on a park bench. There are definitely people who have that view of work. It's a sad view of work where your whole life is based around stealing 45 minutes so that you don't carry more letters. Like, of course, I see all the people saying five head and legend, a true savant. You say that and I know, um, but in the end, that's sad uh, because that guy was spending his life dodging, just dodging. Um, now, maybe he was happy. I don't know. I can't live that way, though. I want to do better. OK, next question. What is the best way to maintain good relationships with coworkers after moving to areas other than outside of work networking? Uh, online, social. So there's no great way like humans need contact. So the best way to maintain good relationships is either relevant stuff in work or outside of work, something. But, you know, maintaining good relationships with people doesn't take that much. The first thing I would ask is, which of them do you want to maintain relationships with? And the next thing I would um, ask is, um, for those people, how can you do that in a, authentic way that doesn't take a lot of your time, a shared interest. For example, if you really want to maintain a relationship with them, you probably have a topic you like to talk to them about. So do that. All right. I constantly demean myself for how far I've made it in my career. So I decide uh, I need to nonstop improve. Then I burn out. How do I keep myself accountable without demeaning myself? Read 10% Happier by Dan Harris. We talked about it earlier. Um, you know, why are you unhappy? Like, remember, career is important. It's good to grow your career, but it is not the core of your value. So you're demeaning yourself. I would say what you need to do is stop tying your value solely to your career. What gives you worth as a human? Um, okay, somebody thought I said something really sage and karmic before. Here you go. Here we go again. Um, you are not a human doing, you're a human being. And it took me a long time. I have not perfected this. I tend to be a human doing, and that's, that's, that's what you're doing. You want to be a human being, be a person and then go do some work, but don't value yourself. You keep yourself accountable by separating your work and your goals from your self worth. And that's hard, but at least now you have the concept. Be a human being. Do work. All right, next thing. How do I stop comparing myself to people that are more successful than me and demeaning myself because of it? Same thing. Um, separate. Those people are more successful maybe than you. They are not worth more. Now, they may think they are. Oh, well, I made more money than you. That makes me a better person. I have a better job than you. That makes me a better person. It doesn't. Who you are and your character is what makes you valuable as a person. Um, but you're, you're again tying work results or economic results to human value. If you believe every human life is equal and it's equally a crime for me to shoot a rich person and shoot a poor person, then um, this is a wrong thought, right? That that more, quote unquote, more successful person is a reason to demean yourself. It might be a reason to challenge yourself on how to work more effectively and how to be smarter about your work. It is not a good reason to question your worth. So I hope that helps. Uh, all right, I'm running out of energy. There's a couple more questions. They came in late. I'm going to call it good um, for the moment. I've enjoyed having you all here. Thank you for coming out. I will be here next Wednesday to talk about career pivots. So if you or someone you know wants to change jobs and wants to change roles, wants to do something else, we will talk about that. I think it's probably popped up here, uh, but in case it didn't, uh, if you want personalized help for me, 
there's a way to get it. Go fill out the form. Um, it's not free. You don't have to do it. This is free. So you're always welcome to get all the free help here by asking questions and showing up. Um, thank you so much to everybody who's been here. Uh, the drink is gone, which means the show is over. It's almost gone. Okay, now the show is over. We will see you next time. Uh, I didn't update that. Oh, really? Well, it's here on the offline. So everybody, cheers and good night. 